Thank you so much. Um, so I struggle a lot with the keynote topic for today. Essentially, I wanted to write something that I'm not sh sure I'm supposed to write, some like get shit done or how to deal with shit of building a company. It always will end up with like a crazy weird word. So just went with a safe option like focus. Nice. The clicky thing works. My name is Marcelo. I'm CEO and co-founder of Remote. And you know, the only reason I'm in, sort of entitled to be here uh, is to talk, talk to you about my experience as a founder, someone building stuff, um, in a, how, you know, what I've done as well. Remote is a company of 1,000 people. We're all across the world, um, all distributed. We don't have an office. We started in 2019, and we built you know, a very big, large organization. And you know, I've not my first time being a, a, a co-founder. Uh, let alone, you know, a leader in a company. So today my talk is going to be, you know, not to tell you exactly what to do, but what shit you should avoid. Because, you know, advice goes, it's very free, um, but it's not, it doesn't mean it's good. So I'm going to talk to you about two phases, two things that usually go when you're building out a product or building out a company. For one, um, let's talk through how you build a company. And then we'll talk a bit about how to build a business and, that why, and why that is somewhat different. As far as building your company goes, there are three important things. Ego, mutation, and outcomes. One of the things that I learned at my own expense is that throughout the years, the one thing that is not needed while you're building a business or a company is your ego. It adds nothing to the table. If anything, it actually detracts. You're leading a lot of people. It's a bunch of people, um, either small when you're very small, very young, uh, young as a company, or quite big. So if everyone be brings their ego to the table, you're probably going to double the amount of people in that room as well. So ego is often confused as being proud, being happy, being deliberate, or even pushy. It has nothing to do with being successful at all. Ego is typically a manifestation of you know, our own in intrinsic instinct to win above everything. It's like, almost like a survival mode. But it most often detracts from the, old, the, old, the end game. So I've never seen a case where the ego actually add anything to the discussion, to the success, or the role of the, the company. Then it goes through mutation. You know, as people, um, we're not yet robots yet, a big emphasis on that, we change quite a lot. We learn, we grow, companies go through the same process. And what we know from building a company is that companies, as, a cult, as far as culture goes, they change drastically every 12 to 18 months. I mean, if you're in a company building a product, you understand, if you look back, where you were 12 to 18 months ago, it's probably a completely different place too, right? So when setting out to build you know, a team, hiring, growing, this is something that has to be very well defined, even with the expectation of your own employees, your colleagues. Because that means that either the company is going to outgrow a lot of the people, but also that the people will outgrow the company. And the odds are it will happen quite a lot. And so if the uh, rules of the game are quite explicit, you avoid situations like you know, someone trying to get onto a job that they are not lo no longer fit for, or they actually are fit for something bigger, more impactful. And that if the company is aware of this, it is fundamentally true that your chances for success together are a lot better. But at the same pace, if none of the parties realizes this. Then you get to a point where you're in a company for three, four years, and maybe you feel that your career stalled. Or maybe the company feels that you're no longer suited to do the job that you're doing. And often is the case that it's a good thing that you both part ways, because you decide to leave the company, or that the company decides that you know, you're great at what you're doing, but not to move forward with the company, or in that role that you thought you'd be taken. So level the expectation of that, even writing that down as you hire someone, you know, make sure that you're both set up in a, in a sort of employer-employee relationship that is quite transparent. So ultimately, 
The last item that is super important, in my opinion, is to understand what matters for every company, for every business, for any project, product, project, task, is what comes out of it. It's very easy to get bogged down with the details of you know, the task, of doing the thing, of the meeting about the meeting for the meeting, or even the bike shedding of the meeting. So ultimately, what you get out of things is the only thing that matters. If you go through you know, several processes of discussions, you know, goals, milestones, roadmaps, discussions around every kind of, any kind of topic, the outcomes are the only things that matter. Yes, you can look at all the work that went through it, all the investment that went through it, but if you achieved nothing, or if you achieved half of what you wanted to, to achieve, that doesn't mean that you were successful. That means that you were a busy bee, but probably you didn't go where you wanted to go. So these are the three main things that as far as building your company goes, it is important to keep in mind. Like, of course, there are many situations, you know, hurdles, problems um, that you're going to face throughout the whole process. And, you know, it's fine not to be fine. In several situations, you will not have the answers. But at least if you, if you realize that these three things are core to how you run a business, you understand that without ego, you can look at things pragmatically. You can analyze your data and make the best decisions out of it. If you understand that both your business, your projects, the changes that you know, the market pushes on you or that you push on the market make have cha heavy changes on your business and your company, then you're ready to adapt to it. And you're not clinging to the status quo of what a company is or should look like or used to look like six months ago. And ultimately, how that together drives the outcomes, the success of that company. And so ultimately, as a baseline, it enables you to start building your business. So as long as you have a baseline to operate internally, you can start building and addressing your needs externally. One of the things that I've learned, you know, uh, as building a business as big as remote and as, as challenging, com complex as remote, is that it's super easy to, you know, follow the rabbit, right? Go down the rabbit hole. Especially when you think, you know, you have all the anxiety, if you're, you know, pumped with all the, you know, that need and drive to get stuff done, and, you know, you have this pool, 10 customers saying they also want that feature, another 20 customers saying they're super keen to sign if you add that one thing. But all this data, all this information means nothing. Because if you're not able to hyper-prioritize, it means that you're going to half-ass a bunch of things rather than, you know, focus and actually deliver one. It's a very big difference when you get to the end of a quarter, semester, whatever uh, you want to measure, and you say, well, actually, we have six half features all in the way. Great. How many customers are affected by that? None. How much revenue can you drop by that? None. So hyper-prioritization comes when it's painful to go through the motions of every day and, th and say, yes, I will not do that extra thing that I think it's important. And as leaders, it's very easy for you to say, well, yeah, but I really need this. Like, my customers really also need that. And I could be really good, and it's going to take less time that I'm going to in odd as much as uh, capacity or resources. Odds are you're always going to need more time, always going to need more people, and you're going to end up distracting you from the main goal. So hyper-prioritization is one of the things that I've found is more super common across all founders, that you say, hey, are you prioritizing? Yeah, absolutely. So how many things are you doing? And then comes the shopping list of all the things that are super important for your business. Like, uh, my business can survive without these 10. Now, the fact is that probably from those 10, only one will drive your business forward in the next year or in the next six months. And what you're doing actually is adding more stuff to your plate, that you're, and you're not going to complete them all at all. And so it's important to understand you know, hyper prioritization happens when from a, a grocery shopping list, you can pick only one to two things, or three tops, if you're really good and really big and you have the money for it, and the rest is just slated to be reduced. If shit hits the fan, you know that all those things can go, and you're only going to focus on that. And so you apply relentless iteration 
and dedication to those items. And yes, you're not going to deliver 10 things, but you're going to deliver three, and then more three, and then more three, and then more three. And you can measure your progress, and you can start capitalizing on that progress too. And as far, you know, we're bombarded every single day with customer requests, customer complaints, with internal ideas, and especially, you know, all founders have great ideas in the shower, either because, you know, they spend too much time on that or just they, they take their time to cry a bit in the shower. And so there's always going to be room and source for inspiration across all what you do, all that you do. But then how do you decide how to prioritize? You know, I've spoken about, you know, the things about building a company and the three motos, but, you know, how does hyper prioritization help you go through, you know, picking from that list? So this is what I usually call taming chaos. Well, it's a f sort of a fancy name, but I needed to put something there. I don't really know what. And so mathematically speaking, you can look at this from a, a very well-known, very old mathematical issue, which is lo local maximum and global maximum. Local maximum and global maximum. So on local maximum, this is usually what we reach when we have a big set of problems, a big set of features, a big set of things that we want to tackle. Because the noise is so, so, so big and so loud that your quality of signal to noise ratio is very poor. That means that because you're not really able to prioritize, that you're going to be left with the things that you think are the best for you to do. Now, the problem is when you're blindsided by the, what you don't know that you don't know. And this is what leads you to the global maximum. The global maximum tells you from the whole universe, what is that one thing that you could be doing to propel your business forward, your team forward, your project forward at the best available speed. So this is typically done when you're able to read the whole universe in a way, section how you read it, and also understand it. And hyper-prioritize helps you do that and also is fueled by that process. And there are many ways and many you know, frameworks that you can read about it. Through experience, I managed to you know, get through something very basic. You'll probably not read about this anywhere. I made it up. It works for me. If it doesn't work for you, well, tough to be you. But to be honest, it does work very well in a matter of simplicity. So if you think through a capacity pipeline, a, a processing pipeline, you get an input, you end up with an output, right? These things are typically, uh, you know, what do you see and, you know, sh in a shopping store, right? You, you, you have someone processing your, your shop, your stuff, it goes beep and then pass it on and you have, you can measure all that goes around from speed, capacity, and efficiency. How fast then can that person process that? You know, how many things that can that person process in parallel? And how well does it get done? And so if you look at you know, any project, any company, any task from these three angles, and they can take completely different aspects. Let me give you an example from engineering perspective. You have a team. And you need to understand how good that team are, are doing. Because you need to understand like, if you've reached a local maximum or if you can improve how that team is doing. Right? Maybe you have a hunch that that team is fast enough or good enough. Maybe you think that they're not really good enough. So you need to understand if they've reached the local maximum or if they're already in a global maximum. So the way to declutter information is to try to match it. So find the one thing that maps its speed. Speed could mean different things across the business. For an engineering team, it could be how fast you ship features, how fast do you fix a bug, or how, fa how fast you, you attend or, re or reply to the first ticket. Capacity is essentially how many things can you process at the same time? How many features does this team ship uh, in a given cycle? How many things get tackled in a div different, uh, same cycle? And efficiency, how many bugs are created? How many you know, escalations, technical escalations do you have? Or even downtime do you have? And so ultimately, you can spin this around for different aspects in different you know, timelines. But ideally, you're going to single out the three more important things per stage of your company, be it revenue, be it customer success, or wherever they are. And you balance them across the three edges. And so by doing that, it paints a very good picture of overall how your business is doing. And so 
doing this, you know, and you can get whatever data you want, but it forces you to hyper-prioritize on these three parameters. And you can absolutely be certain that if you look into the three, you know, top things that you could be doing at a certain point in time, you're going to focus only on that. And, you know, by the theory of optimization, if you focus on the three biggest problems and you eliminate them, your system by default is optimized. So applying a very short, you know, efficiency model like this enables you to propel f quite forward in completely a hyper-optimized way. Now, of course, this matters nothing if you keep doing apply, try to apply that to 10 different things. And that's why hyper-prioritization is super important. So ultimately, at the end of you know, a quarter, it's fine to look at this and say, OK, now I've eliminated you know, my biggest problem with speed. I'm actually going to change this into something else. You'd be amazed at how fast you know, this can propel both your team or your projects because of how much focus can drive a business and how much efficiency it can bring onto what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It, you know, I can't promise you that this will work 100% in all the cases that you have, but I can promise you that it's going to, be do, it's going to be help you do better than not knowing. Because when you don't know what you don't know, then you're going to be completely focused on a local maximum, much rather than a global maximum. So, on the last topic, you know, how do you know if hyper-prioritization and taming the amount of chaos that you have is working? Well, it's quite simple. Now, for one, you keep the main thing the main thing. If you ask anyone around your team, your business, they should all say the same things. If you have three priorities, if you have one priority, if you ask anyone in the business, and you can do this today, maybe you think, well, my company is pretty much uh, hyper-prioritized. We all very fo much focused on delivering what we need to deliver. Easy, do that exercise. Walk around, there's a very old way of doing business, which is walking the floor. You talk to all your employees, ask them the same things. What is the main thing for you? And if you see the disparity in the re responses, that means that you're super far away from what you think you are. And I can bet that, you know, all of you that think, well, but we're super hyper-prioritized. 99% uh, you would not be hyper-prioritized. Even, you know, we try to apply this as much as humanly possible. And to a point that is painfully simple, and by painfully simple, I mean, if you're a leader, you're always thinking about new things, that extra thing, that thing that you also want to nail, that new goal, that new business line. It's going to hurt when you wake up and then you think, well, I'm doing these things, but I should also be doing that and also add that. So at the end of the day, it's going to be painful for you because you'll, you have to remind yourself that you cannot expand upon that and that you're going to get stuck. Um, but when you see the results of your discipline, then you understand how success looks like. So these have been the things that I've been following the, next, the last few years. You know, it's a very simple approach. Um, there's no magic to it. There's no secret sauce. There's no rocket science behind it. Um, this is not behind any, you know, 300-page book. But this is something that I've, we've put together across a lot of different iterations, different models, growing many different teams, and learnings that resonate across, you know, an entire organization that spans across the world. It is about keeping things simple. It is about hyper-focus and reducing chaos to its minimum form. And only that, you have a glimpse of, you know, what focus means to your business. And that's it. Thank you so much. Lovely to be here.